Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Zinati Kuma. And join me to unpack your stock-related questions tonight are Roy Mutoni from Sunlum Investments and Wayne McCurry from FNB Wealth and Investments. Be sure to send your questions via email to stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or via SMS on 41392 or on X at Business Day TV using the hashtag Stockwatch. Thank you so much for your time, uh, gents. Of course, something that has stood out for me today is how the retailers are continuing to fly today. TFG up almost 8%, Mr. Price also same. Um, Chewards up more than 4%, Pipco. Uh, and I mean, I guess there's so many good news. Um, we did have inflation surprising to the uh, downside yesterday, and then also the uh, MPC deciding to keep interest rates unchanged today. Uh, Wayne, I want to start with you. Is there just one way up for the retailers at this point? Well, look, there's two reasons why they're going up. First of all, the shares themselves were very cheap. Same as all, let's call them South African shares, the banks. These are all very cheap shares. I mean, actually, the upside potential, if a few things fall into place, is actually still quite big. That's, that's the first reason they were just cheap. The second reason is why they're going up now is because of the results and trading updates that we've seen to date. I mean, if you just push Woolies to the side for the moment, these are all extremely good updates. And if you concentrate on the South African businesses, so you exclude the Australian, New Zealand, British businesses from all of the, 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 the companies that have reported so far, the pure South African results are mm. actually far higher than expectations. And it's the same for AVI, it's the same for Clicks, it's the same for Mr. Price today. Uh, these are all good willies. In fact, the, the food business was fantastic. So that was quite good. But obviously, the non-food business and the Australian and New Zealand let them down. TFG, the London operation, wasn't that good. Um, they've also got operations in New Zealand as well. I think it didn't do too well. But once again, the South African operations did extremely well. And if you look at clicks, you swear they're not operating in the same consumer, yeah. consumer environment as where that we live in because... These were, quite frankly, spectacular results. Yeah. I mean, even Woolworths, after falling initially when their results came out, they also been pulled up by the very good results coming out of all the other retailers. So it's certainly a lot better than expected. Yeah. Well, it's quite an interesting point that Wayne makes there that, you know, even though we do have some of these retailers um, having exposure to international oh. operations, but it seems that the star of the show was really the South African operations. Roy, is this not deceiving? Um, you know, having us think that the South African consumer is actually quite resilient, or is it just how these companies are managing this kind of environment? There's so much bad news priced into these shares that it takes just a little bit of good news to come through for them to rally. Remember as well, in December, we saw a whole lot less load shedding. So if there was less load shedding, the shops were functioning, the malls were all open, and people were out there. And if you count in staycations and everything, maybe that was a good thing. I mean, Mr. Price results that came out this morning showed they're also expanding space-wise. Um, so, so I think when you put all of these things together and where you have such a low starting point, you will, you will have rallies like we've seen. Um, it's not to say that it's unjustified, but exactly like Wayne is saying, they, they started off so cheap, they could rally another 10, 15, 20% and still offer a reasonable value. All the market is looking for is um, where's, where's, where's the catalyst? Where's, where's the thing that makes us suddenly feel, okay, now is the time when we can get in and rally the share price? Ah, all right. Well, as we're talking about the mm -hmm. consumer, uh, let's get to City Lodge. Um, mm -hmm. A typical question, uh, but I'm very uh, curious about their occupancy level, levels and rates for the month of December. Does the panel have advice on how to source such information? Well, I guess that would be in a, a trading statement. Mm. I don't know if we've had any since then. I feel like it might be too soon. Um, but otherwise, uh, the viewer says, otherwise I would appreciate the panel's view on City Lodge's ability to keep occupancies at strong levels, 60% mm. uh, plus, but also keep making ground on raising room rates. Wayne, uh, your view on City Lodge and mm. its ability to keep uh, that momentum on occupancies going? Well, look, we all know tourists coming into South Africa is at record highs. We offer a great product at a very cheap price if you're paying in dollars or euros or pounds 
I mean, you, you actually can't beat it, quite frankly, almost worldwide. So the foreigners are coming in. Locals are also traveling a lot. I mean, you fly in an aeroplane now, there's no empty seats anywhere. You book into a hotel. Hotels are quite good occupancies. You know, no city lodge per se doesn't attract that much foreign in, uh, uh, tourists per se, but uh, it's still a good business. And this is the one growth industry in South Africa. So when they'll see occupancy rates, as you correctly said, will probably be if when they come up with a trading update or, or, or release their next set of results. They'll quite clearly give that. But the last set that came out was looking good. I actually like all the leisure and entertainment shares on our stock market, simply because, as, as Roy also mentioned, there's a lot of staycation going on here. I mean, you're not shooting off to, you know, for winter in Germany at that, that this current exchange rate. So lots yeah. of staycation. Business travel is big. Aeroplanes are full. Hotels are reasonably well full. So I think it's very good for City Lodge and shares like that. Yeah, there seems to really be a good tourism story. Uh, I was uh, just talking to uh, Patricia Delil, the Minister of Tourism, yesterday, um, and basically we're about 96% of the 29 levels um, in terms of uh, tourism. Uh, but also, I mean, uh, she was also saying that uh, it's not just international people that are coming here. Domestic uh, travel is also pretty good. Even uh, people from other African countries are coming into South Africa. Um, and they're also working on plans to boost uh, business uh, travel as well. Uh, Roy, what do you make of City Lodge right now? Would this still be a good time to go in? Or maybe it, it has run maybe a little bit um, since last year? So, so maybe to first answer the question about the statistics. So Stats SA does produce um, aggregated stats about um, food and beverage and accommodation. It does. It's not specifically City Lodge. It will give you a broad idea mm. of the industry. So that's a useful one to, 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 to follow because that gives you where the trend lines are. Yeah. With regards to City Lodge, I, I, li I like their strategy. I mean, when was it in... November or December, I actually stayed in their VNA waterfront hotel. And the diversity of people there, there was business people, there were tourists, um, there were people from up country, um, and, and it was full, despite it being under renovation. So it, it looks like quite a solid story. It plays into that segment of the SA economy that still seems to be to be growing. I mean, you have to be sure about valuation levels and all of that, but very clearly they've overcome the problems they had when they had all the Africa operations and COVID and, and all of that. And uh, vacancies vacancies are declining and their occupancy is actually rising. So it's it's well worth a good look by, by the prudent investor. Yeah. What about AVI? Uh, Wayne, uh, I think you mentioned uh, AVI uh, earlier on, and they did have a trading update. Uh, when was it? Two days ago. Um, and revenue growth there, but I think more than 7%. I think there were only two divisions that uh, struggled. That was INJ and the personal care business. But would that hmm. one be worth looking into at this point? But I think you've jumped the gun. That's my stock pick, so oh. we can talk about it. <laughs> okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. Hold that thought. Uh, Roy, okay. over to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a surprisingly good trading update. So AVI has a very solid management team and a very good, um, I would say, very resilient business model where they, they try and hold on to their margins and they don't let price get away. Um, you know, a lot of people, do, when volumes are not there, they'll cut their prices mm. and try and attract that. And that, you never win. You, it, it's always such a struggle. They've got, um, they've, they've got a multi-tier strategy, which allows them to pick the high end, the middle, and the bottom end. And in this result, well, this trading update, you actually saw them gain some volume, which is amazing in this environment. The consumer is struggling in their categories. You'd expect significant competition um, and, and no volume growth, which is what we've been seeing from the food producers. But they had volume growth and they had price gains. Um, and as always, the cost control was exactly on point. So you saw them doing extremely well in those, in those categories. I mean, INJ, we knew that from Sea Harvest and Oceana and all of that, that was going to be a, a difficult time. But... No, if, I mean, AVI is well managed, doesn't grow really fast. This was totally out of character, um, but in a good way. I mean, double-digit growth during times like this um, definitely warrants a second look.
Yeah, all right. Well, let's talk about uh, coronation. Uh, there's a viewer that is asking for your view on coronation. Of course, we know that uh, counters like these are dependent on market performance. And we have, for example, had Colter coming out and talking about assets under management that increased 5% uh, between the third and the fourth quarter. But, of course, um, a lot of... Actually, wait, would you say that th there's still a lot of volatility priced or into these stocks and maybe that gives them a discount? Well, look, generally speaking, asset managers and life assurers are really proxies for market returns. And of course, the equity market's the biggest market. So they are heavily geared. Their fee income is by and large geared to how the market does, how their portfolios perform, et cetera. And I mean, Coronation's been around a very long time and they're extremely good asset managers. Uh, so if you think we're in for a bull market, you know, you must buy these fund management companies, 91 Coronation. Quilt is not quite a fund management company. It's more of a, I suppose, a, a financial services hub, a private investment type of hub. But yes, that as well. Mm. Coronation in particular has got this case going on with SARS, where they made a huge provision and they're still confident that they're going to win this case in the constitutional court. They won the first case. SARS won the second case, now it's the third case, they've taken it up to the Constitutional Court. And they, I mean, six months of earnings just disappeared in that provision. Yeah. So, you know, maybe the market's still putting in a bit of discount for that. I don't know whether who's going to be right or wrong and who's going to win on that case, but it's another factor you must take into account in coronation. But all asset managers, all financial services companies similar to that, all plays on the equity market. I think we're in for a good equity market, so I think there will be quite good buys, you know, right now and for hopefully give you decent returns over the next two to three years. Yeah. But they are geared. Coronation is one of the better ones, Coronation and 91. Well, yeah, I was actually about to say, because Coronation seems to be one of the favorites. Of course, it did give investors jitters when they came out with, you know, the whole SARS uh, issue. Um, and yeah, as Wayne said, it, it, it's not clear if the markets have fully uh, priced in the outcome of that. Um, yeah, uh, Roy, at this point, Coronation, would you be going in or not? So, so Coronation, Wayne, Wayne has it exactly on, on point that markets are what drive it. But I think there's a couple of other things to consider. Coronation is effectively owner managed. A lot of the employees are shareholders, and that's how they get rewarded. So you have consistency, and people stay there for quite a long time. So that performance builds on its on, on itself. Mm -hmm. Again, because it's owner managed, the dividend yield is relatively high um, because these guys own shares and I suppose that's that's one of the ways they get remunerated. So so if if you're optimistic about markets and, and you want to look at a team that's been together for a long time and that has been producing the goods, um, this is definitely one to look at. 91 is slightly different in the sense that 91 is more of a global business. Um, Coronation is mostly a South African business that raises money here and invests it globally. 91 raises money everywhere. Um, and that's that 91 will be a reflection of, um, of global flows of global equity markets, of, of global markets as, as a whole. So slight difference in, in exposure, but effectively what Wayne says, absolutely. When markets are running, these stocks do well. Um, I want to start off with uh, Cecil, because it did come out with a trading update today. Um, and but and I did actually notice that the share price uh, actually improved today by about 2%. Uh, Roy, I want to start with you. Uh, why, is, uh, why are Sasol shares so volatile, and where do you expect Sasol to bottom out? Well, Sasol is quite cheap. If you've seen, it's really sold off quite significantly over the last six months. So there's a couple of things that you have to keep in mind with Sasol. First of all, because of ESG issues and the fact that it's largely concentrated in South Africa means its primary investor base is South African. If you're an American investor or a, U a U um, European investor, you have your pick of integrated um, oil, oil producers. You can go ExxonMobil and all, all of those. So I think for all of them, the easiest thing is to get one of those more diversified ones and leave, um, leave Sassel with its ESG issues. Now, Sassel is also quite highly geared. Um, they're in chemicals, and the chemical cycle isn't quite near the top. It's probably close to the bottom. 
The, and, and we know the whole issues around, around production in SA. So, so basically with a company like Sasso, there's so many complexities and so many issues. And the fact that its investor base is so narrow means that it will always look cheap. They'll pay a good dividend, um, but for the multiple to go match its international peers, a lot else has to happen. We haven't seen that happen in recent years. And remember, things tend to go wrong quite often with Sasso. Big projects go wrong, um, something goes wrong. And we've seen that time and time and time again. So I think investors have been burnt. Um, the valuation is cheap. It probably does offer value. But I think the average guy out there figures, what's going to make it rally? It's not going to be international investors coming in. Um, it clearly is not a combination of the oil price and commodities and maybe management not making a mistake again. So it's one of those ones that I think everyone looks at, everyone owns, there is no marginal buy, but is incredibly cheap. Yeah. Uh, yeah, quite an interesting question there. What is going to make Sassel really? Um, Wayne, on your part, I mean, it, it just recovered mm -hmm. about by 2% uh, today, but it had been under <clears> pressure for a lot, um, quite a lot uh, in the last while. And I'm wondering if maybe this is some investors thinking that it's it's too cheap to pass up yeah look i mean exactly what roy said sasol is just cheap there's no other ways you can look at it. there are plenty of issues there i mean management previous management in sasol in sasol destroyed value massively you know by going into lake charles i mean the amount of money they destroyed was actually scandalous quite frankly i mean maybe only old mutual did worse than that in the in in, in the early 2000s late 1990s destroying money but putting that aside the share is just cheap you never know what the catalysts are going to be for a cheap share to go up maybe there's not a catalyst you know um i firmly believe that you know the the bad news bad news peaks the day before the share price goes up so you just surround whenever a share is cheap you're only surrounded by bad news and you can never see through the woods to see the good news coming i mean take the the sa retailers last week no one would have bought them and say no load shedding ports transnet yeah political uncertainty weak grand blah 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 no one would have bought them last week they're cheap they were cheap now we've had two or three sets of results they're shooting the lights out mm. you know so if you believe in a company and you believe that it, in Cecil's case that it's by and large a cyclical uh, company and it's cheap enough, why not buy it? You know, be, but I mean, it's everything's got risk. You know, nothing comes without risk in investments, but certainly the shares now as cheap as what it's been over the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, quite an interesting question here. Um, my Tungela, Sasol and Sibanya shares are horribly down and have been for some time. I realize commodities are cyclical and we are in a down cycle at the moment. Uh, would I do better to sell them, sell them and make losses and rather buy something like the S&P 500? Or should I hold on because the cycle will eventually turn and my losses will start to diminish? Uh, Roy, yeah, if you're in these stocks that have taken quite a beating, would this be the uh -huh. right time to leave and g make your losses and go to S&P 500? Or you hold so, on? so the theory behind investing is mm. buy low, sell high. Yeah. Typically, if you're able to do that 50, 60% of the time, you'll do well. Now, these shares have all been sold off for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it also depends on the investor's portfolio and risk preference and everything. But by and large, they've been sold off for a variety of reasons. And they look cheap relative to their expected earnings, book values, or whatever metrics you want. The S&P 500, on the other hand, is rallying on the back of seven stocks that are quite that have quite elevated multiples. Maybe they're not too expensive, but a lot of their valuation depends on good things happening in the future and for long. So effectively, what you would be doing in the absence of superior knowledge is saying, I'm going to go away from these cheap things. I'm going to buy the expensive thing. And the one reason that you do that is because you believe the expensive thing will become more expensive. Yeah. Now, there's no more dangerous um, a thesis than that. I think you'd have to do a lot more homework. So I'll tell the investor, don't be despondent now. There's a reason why you bought these shares. What's changed? Has your rationale changed? Have, has your original assumption gone wrong? 
And only on the basis of that do you decide. Um, maybe I dump these and I look for something else. But that trade is definitely um, selling cheap and buying expensive. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah because also the second part of the question goes: Would something like the S and P five hundred not recover my losses before the next commodity upcycle? So it's just what you've said, yeah. Roy, that uh, you expect the S and P five hundred, which is uh, expensive, to get even more expensive. I mean, uh, Wayne, mm -hmm. if you were to really be in a spot where you're trying to sell these stocks, uh, Tungela, Sasol, and Sibanye, mm -hmm. would there be one or two or all of them that you you're just you, you don't want to sell? Well, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell now. Exactly what Roy said. Don't evaluate a share until you know where you are in the cycle. We are more than likely at the bottom of the commodity cycle, and more than likely the next two or three years is going to give us a commodity up cycle. Now, during that period, the mining shares do well, the RAND recovers, and relative to American markets, our market does very well. Mm. That's a normal commodity cycle. And hopefully we do get that. I certainly think we are going to get. The second point is, don't ever make a decision on a share based on the price you paid for it. You must make a decision on the share saying, today, mm. is this share cheap or expensive? Doesn't matter what you paid for it. People, lots of people sell shares because, oh, I lost money. I'm losing money. I'm a sell. And you end up selling at the bottom and you end up selling. You bought them when they were expensive, maybe and you're selling them when they were cheap. So you must always say, today, would I buy or sell this share, irrespective of what price you paid for it. The second thing is, never put all your eggs in one basket. Have a diversified portfolio where when you hit issues like this, it doesn't kill you, and it doesn't kill you for your performance and mm. put you under intense pressure to do something. Quickly, before we go to your stock pick, uh, you've already mentioned it, so I'm sure you uh, will only have a short time for your stock pick, but a, a quick question. Uh, investment analysts are predicting an almost guaranteed reduction in interest rates this year and the possibility of a U.S. recession. Bullish for bonds. If a bond ETF trades at $100 yielding 3.5% and the yield drops to 2.5%, will the capital value increase to $140? Wayne. Look, technically, you're right. It doesn't go to 140. If it was a 30-year bond and your yield goes, let's just be simple, your yield goes from 3 to 2, then you make a 33% capital gain. Um, it's not quite, but effectively, that is what you make. So if it's a 10-year bond and it goes from 3.5 to 2.5, you probably make a 20% without a calculator on me, a 20% capital gain. But the theory is right. Yes, remember, it's in dollars if you're buying the dollar bond. Um, but yes. A 10-year bond goes, the yield goes from 3 to 2%. As I said, you probably make a 20% capital gain. There's a whole long calculation you can do, and there's a special formula that works it out. But essentially, the, uh, the viewer is correct. All right. Quickly, Wayne, anything to add? Any bullet points for AVI as your stock pick? Very quickly. I mean, uh, Roy actually sold it there for me. Yeah. So they can pass on margin. The people love their snacks. I mean, we've all been snacking and drinking entice cool drinks over the whole of December like there's no tomorrow. They can up prices. They can maintain their margin. They didn't get a volume squeeze. I&J should not be there. I cannot understand why they keep that business with these other high-quality businesses. The footwear and the fashion didn't do that well, but the snacks and the drinks pulled them through. And most importantly, you know, up until the run we've seen over the last two days, this was an, uh, quite a cheap share. I mean, it was rated at about a 12 per price earnings ratio, which for AVI is low. When you compare that to Clicks, Clicks is at 24, and they're both quality businesses. So that's why I'm going for AVI. All right. On your side, Roy, what are you going for today? Greenrod. Um, so, so that's it's a perfect example of a of an of a business that's benefiting from other people foot faulting, specifically Transnet. And now you're seeing that they're benefiting from other countries deciding that actually rather than transiting into Transnet's problems, we're going to use other ports. So they, they were very fortuitous in the way they cited their investments um, historically, and they're benefiting from that right now. It's not boom bust. You can see it's gradually improving. The investment continues to grow, and the share price is responding. So I think that's one well worth watching. Ah, all right. Well, thanks so much for your time, gents, and your analysis today. Really appreciate it. That is all for Stockwatch uh, tonight. Uh, thanks to our guests, Roy Motooni from uh, Sunlam Investments and Wayne McCurry from FNB Wealth and Investments. Up next, the close. Stay watching. <laughs>